everyone. Um, thanks, uh, Larry, for inviting me to speak uh, to you. Um, I'll be talking today um, on sort of a vision of 6G. There is no 6G yet, but um, I'll talk a little bit about what it might be and uh, give just, you know, hopefully you know, generate some interesting um, discussion and, 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 and thinking about where cellular communications are going in the next uh, decade or so. Um, I last spoke here in 2018, and then I realized before that, 2013, so I guess I'm kind of on a uh, half decade cadence here for speaking about this. And um, so, you, you know, perhaps you can get the slides from Larry to see if I got anything right about 5G. I, I reviewed, I, I was about 50% on, you know, I'm sorry, I'd say, <laughs> in 2013. Um, okay, so I'll give a, just a brief introduction to um, our research center at UT that's focused on 6G. is the first um, major uh, academic research center in North America on 6G. And um, just tell, tell you a little about me and us. And then um, I've framed the talk around six questions on 6G, um, starting with sort of what's going on with 5G, since obviously that is a big uh, part of what will uh, 6G need to do differently. Um, so we'll, 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 we'll address some of these questions just at a very high level, just kind of one slide each. And then uh, I think Ruben and I will have a Q&A, which you'll be welcome to join in on as well, um, if we can just discuss uh, what the future of cellular looks like. Um, so uh, we have, uh, like I mentioned, a, a, a large research center at UT Austin, just a mile north of here, um, focused on 6G communications and many different aspects of it. Um, it. We founded it last, well, I guess now I have to say two years ago, um, in uh, summer of 2021. Um, and uh, it, it's been very successful in um, galvanizing the industry. So we have all these industry sponsors, also um, National Instruments and Amazon are in the process of joining the, this week, actually. Um, and so, you know, you can see the, the, the companies that, that, um, that invest in our center and attend our events and, and talk with us and sponsor research really run the gamut from like sort of companies like Qualcomm and Ericsson that you'd expect um, to, you know, companies like NVIDIA that are trying to get into the uh, business and apply their machine learning technology and hardware to 6G base stations, test and measurement companies trying to get ahead of the curve, you know, AT&T, um, and then you know various other companies, including car companies, that are even trying to track what's going on in cellular, so they can plan their next generation of connected vehicles and autonomous cars. So um, we do about 10 million a year in research expenditures, which is a pretty big number for a for an academic research center. Uh, we have uh, a little over 20 faculty, over 100 PhD students, and we've won a great, great uh, number of awards over the years. I'll bring a little bit more about us. Just uh, we had impacts on LTE and 5G. Um, over half of 5G data traffic is controlled by Albovic's algorithms for video compression. Um, and uh, we had many other uh, things. I won't go through all of them, but um, did some of the earliest work on small cell modeling um, a little over 10 years ago that um, really set uh, the entire theoretical framework for how that works. Had the mo wrote the most cited paper on 5G. Um, uh, you know, in terms of an uh, academic publication, and did and actually the first ever millimeter wave outdoor measurements that were you know used to show that um, millimeter wave could work for outdoor applications were done at UT on our buildings, which are now demolished to make way for new buildings. And Ted Rappaport and his students uh, did those uh, in concert with our affiliates in like 2010 to 12. Um, so anyway, it's just a little background um, on the center there. Um, so first of all, what's the status of 5G? Um, I know that it's a diverse audience here, and some of you may work for operators or know quite a bit about this. But just at a, at a high level, um, you know, uh, 5G was first standardized towards the end of 2017. This honestly was faster than I expected when I spoke here in 2013. I predicted it would be 2019 or 2020. I think a lot of people were surprised at how quickly they wound up converging on a standard. And I'll talk a little bit about why that might have been possible. Um, and we, roughly a two-year cadence uh, for releases through the 5G era. And right now, that's, uh, you know, there's, it's been divided into the first three, three releases. Um, the third has just been uh, uh, you know, finished kind of in 20, I list these dates, but really it's a whole range of dates. So really, release 17 was really released in 20, um, 2022 last year, but you know, kind of started and defined in 2021. And now we're in the 5G advanced era. And so release 18, they're looking at various enhancements. But you know, Qualcomm will say something different. But in my opinion, these enhancements will, will be pretty um, incremental. Right? It's going to build on the, the 5G framework and add small features or small tweaks to uh, support um, applications or to fix things that uh, operators don't like. Um, you know, I think if you know if you talk to people um, right now, they don't really understand what how 5G is different. You know, when they use their smartphone, there's, there's not a huge subjective difference. Um, you know, the, the millimeter wave feature really is cover. You know, it's carrying. You know, the operators won't tell you exactly, but my understanding is under five percent of the bits uh, actually go over millimeter wavelengths, which are the really kind of exciting high rate part of 5G. And so, you know, 5G has 
you know, kind of kept everything going and kept up with the, the growth in data, but it hasn't really changed the customer experience or really enabled lots of new applications um, as it you know, was sort of predicted to do or hoped. So um, you know, why, why is that? Well, um, you know, just to review what 5G was trying to do, and you know, there's sort of a, um, uh, what's the, what, you know, kind of a uh, narrative in the industry that like odd Gs introduce a bunch of new things and then even Gs make them work, right? So like 1G kind of introduced voice, but kind of really was crappy, and then 2G really made voice you know, work for everyone, work well, became global standard, everyone got a cell phone. You know, 3G tried to introduce data, did it, but really didn't do a great job. It was, you know, it was, it's still, it was a CDMA standard, really focused still on voice, and then 4G did data right. And so that, you know, the kind of narrative continues that 5G tried to introduce several new things all at once and sort of took baby steps towards them, you might say, um, while trying to kind of play it safe on sticking with what they knew as well. And so perhaps 6G will be when these applications really um, are designed natively in. So that, the, the three major things, and you've probably seen this triangle before, it's been shown way too many times, but uh, 5G was designed to, um, of course, support you know, uh, further uh, smartphone traffic, uh, which is the top here, the enhanced mobile broadband. And kind of the key novel feature there was adding millimeter wave spectrum. Um, and I'll talk a, bit, a little bit more about spectrum later, but um, you know, the spectrum meaning like the 28 gigahertz, to 40 gigahertz range, a couple major bands were allocated of over one gigahertz each. Um, and so you know, this allowed um, at least to plausibly have data rates in the gigabit per second uh, uh, type range. Uh, to, a, to a single phone. It also tried to support um, very um, to mass, uh, to what's called mission critical IoT or ultra, um, ultra reliable low latency communication. This is intended for things like driverless cars or telemedicine or robotics that need very tight, tight uh, latency loops and feedback control. Um, the problem is, it's, if you know anything about communications, it's very, very hard to do low latency and high reliability at the same time. Those are like contradictory. And so, and the only way you can do that is by just basically driving the data rate down to like a pathetic level. So this hasn't been super successful, um, in my opinion. I think you know it was one of these things where they let the people who um, like in smart factories and so on drive the specifications for what they want rather than what really the, the network could deliver. Um, and then the other um, application is massive IoT, and the idea here is to have lots of cheap devices. Um, you know, one, one could register. You know, for a dollar, two, three dollars a month, um, and you know, would provide wide uh, connectivity, very long battery life, very long uh, life cycle um, items. So things, you know, like um, sensors or water meters, you know, and uh, things that would you know be persist for much longer than a smartphone. Um, and so this is the kind of the other uh, aspect of the triangle. So these are very sort of you know, so the idea is that the network needs to support all three applications, but not simultaneously, and you so you use different features in the standard to do that. The problem is that there's just a single common waveform um, for 5G, and it pretty much inherits the LTE waveform. So this is like the first time going from one G to another that, that the waveform stayed basically constant. So the LTE waveform, OFDMA waveform, um, all the control channels actually carry over to 5G. So there's a very, I mean, it's not strictly backwards compatible, but it's very similar. And this is a, this is a figure from Qualcomm that kind of shows how they pack, try to pack all these use cases in. Um, you know, in particular, like uh, with the, you, the the ultra reliable low latency traffic can actually puncture the, uh, the the smartphone traffic, and so this this hasn't been terribly successful, particularly in the uplink. Um, but I think yeah, the, the key thing to understand is that um, there wasn't a really big change. The people were pretty happy with the LT waveform and, and the and the performance, and so they didn't make a, a large change. Just some 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 tweaks really. Okay, so what um, what will be uh, major 6G applications? I think you know people are still waiting for I, some of these IoT applications to take off. I think um, you know, the business models there are can be challenging. Um, you know, AT and T is not used to selling to you know random devices. It's it's a, it's a different business model. Um, but I think that when you you know if you talk to people about what they're targeting for 6G in the 2030s timeframe, what will be exciting applications and some general themes that you'll you'll hear. Um, one is you know, essentially immersive experiences. I mean, I think everyone's still waiting for what's after the smartphone. Can we have a device which delivers content to us in a more intuitive way that doesn't involve us staring at a screen you know, for hours a day and bumping into people as we walk, for example, or you know, having to leave conversations to stare at a text message? Is there some way this can be delivered in a 
more natural, intuitive way. Um, of course, you know, lots of money is being invested in this by you know huge huge tech companies with, you know, some mixed results, shall we say? Um, but I think there's there is a huge amount of investment and um, hope that this will be a major application in the 2030s, and it'll have very some different quite, quite different requirements than smartphone uh, uh, traffic. Um, you know, there's still hope that there'll be a lot of um, autonomous devices in the network. And the, the key thing about a lot of these applications, both the XR and um, the ones I list in the second bullet, is they require um, extensive knowledge of the environment. So they need to know who's around me, where walls are, where objects are, and then also be able to track this over time. So sensing and situational awareness is viewed as kind of a key uh, new thing that will be uh, in 6G and built into the standard. Um, you know, obviously our devices themselves can sense and learn, but, but the network itself will try to do some of the sensing because it can actually do that without having to convince Apple to feed back sensitive information. And the other big um, theme that kind of goes into this is uh, building very uh, comprehensive digital models of the real world and to eventually merge physical and virtual worlds in many uh, different dimensions. So this is kind of a little bit uh, science fiction-y, but um, this, is a, this is a big theme. Um, as, we, as we move towards 6G. And then, you know, you can see these numbers, these are just, of course, projections, but the idea is that the, the market will go up, you know, over 100x for XR type applications um, by 2030. Okay, so what are some key new technical directions to support this? Um, you know, at 6G at UT, we've identified four. I'll talk about a couple of them uh, on future slides, but two that kind of go together that we're working on a lot there is the sensing piece, which I mentioned. So this is using the base stations. The base stations, if you think about it, are ideal sensors. They're mounted high. Um, they have, you, you, they, they send out radio waves. And as we move to higher frequencies, these radio waves are very similar to what's used for radar and tracking. So you can actually use, reuse the, the, the bandwidth, not only for communication, but for sensing um, applications to, use, to do radar or localization of objects. Um, and then, of course, you can put other uh, LIDAR or uh, perhaps cameras, although there's a, you know, um, uh, confidentiality, you know, privacy issues there rather. Um, but, uh, but you know, this we think is a, is a key aspect of the 6G standard and, um, and from a valuation standpoint, maybe something interesting that would be new. So the network could actually not only offer communications um, as a service, but also sensing as a service. It could provide information <laughs> to um, applications uh, like XR applications and driverless cars that they need to, to function at their um, uh, full level. And then a key part of this is you know, machine learning, which has you know, really taken the, um, several industries by storm since the 5G era. Um, there's a lot of people looking at how uh, machine learning will affect 6G. And there's very, very ambitious visions like NVIDIA that the entire base station will become just a deep learning engine and all the, the entire modem will essentially be subsumed by GPUs and uh, neural network type processors. And then there's more, shall we say, sober views um, that uh, you know, machine learning will play a key role and, and, and allow different um, blocks in the communication system to be merged and to essentially adapt um, to the environment. So I, I, I'm personally very excited about this. Um, I think um, uh, there's many, many places where this can really be uh, transformative in making the communication system work well. So for example, um, if you know, coupled with sensing, the machine learning can take in huge amounts of data, learn the propagation environment very well. For so, for something like millimeter wave, instead of just blindly trying beams and to align beams, which is the main bottleneck um, to making millimeter wave spectrum effective, it can learn, um, you know, from the environment what beam would be likely uh, work for a given UE based on its location and other fingerprinting, and it can just immediately do the beam alignment. We, and we've shown with very detailed simulations in my group but recently that you can get about a 500x speed up um, in uh, beam alignment um, using a deep learning uh, approach with a lot of training. Um, okay, spectrum, All right. obviously every new G um, you know, tries to bring in new spectrum. Um, in 5G, the, the main new spectrum was in the C-band. This has been quite successful. Um, so you know, the three and a half gigahertz to four and a half gigahertz type band is being rolled out. Um, the millimeter wave spectrum, um, as I mentioned, has, um, is very exciting, and there's tons of bandwidth there, but has not uh, made a huge uh, uh, impact yet. Um, and you know, the reasons are you need dense base stations. It really is an outdoor-to-outdoor -outdoor technology. It doesn't go through walls or even tinted glass. Um, 
And uh, the devices have been very slow. It's actually, you know, it's expensive to put this in the devices. You need little planar arrays. You need perhaps three of them because your hand can block it because uh, these frequencies don't go through your hand. Um, uh, you get like a 100x loss in signal power just from your hand. Um, so uh, there's still a lot of work to do there. And so uh, when we go to 6G, um, you know, I like this picture from Nokia that, <laughs> that, I, uh, that I found that kind of shows it will keep, will carry all these bands over to 6G, but then add a lower band that'll have not very much bandwidth there, but for, for using for these low rate, ultra wide area, low power IoT applications. Um, a really exciting development, in my opinion, is that there's a lot of effort being made to open up various bands in the 7 to 20 gigahertz range. The idea is um, that this spectrum at the lower end, like seven or eight gigahertz, will be not that different to, from like current Wi-Fi spectrum at five gigahertz. Uh, but you can pack lots of you know, lots of antenna elements in there and do highly directional transmissions, um, but with a lot better propagation than we're getting at millimeter wave. And the idea is you can do things that would avoid some some incumbents in the spectrum that are, you know, for example, satellites. That it might be possible to have satellites using some of the spectrum while on the ground, we use it in a, in a way that doesn't interfere with the satellites. Um, so, this, it, so we have some projects going on on this, uh, it's called upper mid-band spectrum. So we, this is expected to be part of the global 6G uh, spectrum uh, play and something kind of new that could provide a lot of capacity. And then there, um, also uh, a lot of people working on even higher frequencies than millimeter wave. I'm personally skeptical this will have much effect um, on a typical 6G experience because for the same reason as millimeter wave hasn't, and this is even harder to use. But it is very interesting from a sensing point of view. Um, you can get extremely fine grained resolution at these uh, so-called sub terahertz uh, frequencies. So this this will probably be in there. Uh, how big of an impact it has, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. I'm, not, I'm a little skeptical, but I do think the, the this spectrum will be a key piece of 6G. Okay. Um, another question uh, that you know I have and um, you know I get a lot is like 5G did very little to really improve coverage. So I mean, if you go, and I think during COVID, many of us realized that when we went to remote places, it was hard to get coverage. I mean, even just in our own country, uh, you know, I, I spent two months in Colorado in the summer to escape the heat here, and like no place had like decent coverage. I mean, other like like unless you were like in downtown Aspen, it just, I couldn't do, you know, almost anything in, 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 the, in, in the mountains of Colorado. Um, and so it obviously it's even worse in other countries that aren't as developed as ours. And so how do we uh, get to a global coverage to really, you know, enable um, everyone to have a broadband connection that wants one anywhere in the world? And, you know, the, it, the very exciting development, I think, which is kind of taking a lot of us by surprise, is the ability to densely deploy LEO uh, satellites um, you know, Starlink has really uh, sh shown the way there and you know, radically lowered the cost of launching a satellite by 20x or so. And so we're looking at having tens of thousands of satellites up in low Earth orbit um, compared to like hundreds five years ago um, in the 6G era. So how does this, how will this work with 6G? Um, it's, a, you know, it's obviously a different system. These systems that are being put up like Starlink um, and uh, Kuiper by Amazon. Um, you know, will not be standards compliant. They won't conform to the 6G standard, but they can be used as like a broadband, as a backbone for this terrestrial 6G network by linking to small cells or linking to other, they, you know, they need, they won't ever be able to go straight to a smartphone. I mean, you know, there's been a lot of excitement about this, uh, you know, iPhone being able to send, you know, uh, uh, an emergency message to a Global Star satellite, which is a LEO satellite. Actually, I, I engineered, that was my first job out of college. I worked on Global Star in the 90s. So it's kind of a full circle. Um, but if you just look at the physics of it, you'll never be able to do a Zoom call straight from your laptop, you know, to a, to a satellite. It just, it just, it just won't work. Um, you, you, the, the loss is too much. Um, but, you know, this could provide global coverage in, in other ways. Um, so I think this is a very, very um, interesting question. People are actively thinking about how to get broadband to the masses. You know, and the obvious way, you know, the end consumer device will be like a, a smartphone or some sort of uh, 6G modem. Um, so with that, um, I'll conclude my, uh, my, my portion of just uh, talking to you and we can have a discussion next. Um, if you want more information on 6G, you know, come to our website, come to our event on March 29th. We focused on the metaverse, but be broadly on 6G. Um, also, I think something to be aware of is for the first time, 
Um, North America is binding, um, binding together in this uh, thing called the Next G Alliance. I don't know if any of you have heard of it, uh, but it's a real thing actually. Um, and the idea was that uh, there's a view that you, the U.S. got a little bit left behind in 5G um, by uh, China and Europe. And uh, we want to be leading uh, what 6G is and defining it in a way that suits us. And so the entire ecosystem from operators to vent, you know, everybody kind of involved in this. I'm, I'm, UT, 6G at UT is part of it. So I, I can tell you it's very active. And, um, and I think a lot of the groundwork for 6G is being laid there. They've released some pretty helpful white papers that kind of give the consensus view uh, on what 6G is. I mean, it's, they kind of put everything in there to not hurt anyone's feelings. So it won't be like take any controversial stands. But, um, but this is, um, uh, it's, a, it's a nice resource for kind of seeing what is uh, what the industry is thinking as they move towards 6G. That's it. I wanted to first introduce myself. My name is Ruben Miranda. I'm a managing director at Kroll. Uh, we are one of the sponsors uh, for this conference, uh, two-day conference. Uh, Kroll is the former uh, company known as Duff and Phelps. Uh, we do valuations for uh, financial reporting, purchase price allocations, uh, impairments, uh, and also portfolio evaluation in addition to our work as property tax. Um, Kroll is also the, the company that's uh, is kind of a larger parent that now gets involved in more technology. Uh, we do a lot more cybersecurity. Uh, we also do receivership, so uh, things like the legacy prime clerk is now under our umbrella, so uh, quite a bit of number of uh, business services that we do. Um, you know, I wanted to spotlight two of these before we get uh, going into the questions was uh, just, you know, as far as the telecom world, what uh, sort of things Coral can offer. Uh, one of them went in, is, is actually kind of surprising to me, which is actually a pollution control. Uh, if you ever are uh, looking into the opportunities to uh, identify uh, assets that are potentially uh, offering a pollution uh, control benefits, uh, such as soil mitigation or erosion control, uh, you know, that's actually a situation where um, that, that is a property um, that may be subject to some type of exemption, whether it's in Texas or some other states. And so we do quite a bit of work on that to help identify that. And then the other one is, uh, you know, if you've ever uh, been paying attention to the Inflation Reduction Act, there's quite a bit of, of, of clean energy credits uh, that are now available. And one of the um, uh, services that we are now offering is we are able to broker uh, uh, clean energy uh, agreements uh, for facilities. So if you ever have this uh, interest where if you're, you know, wireless uh, uh, edge center or if your cell site uh, or your, your ILEC uh, CO uh, is in need of some type of clean energy uh, uh, sourcing, then we can help with that. Uh, so got that spiel out of the way. Uh, we have some questions. I don't know if anybody has one, but we can ask some right now. Uh, I'll kick one off, uh, Jeff. Um, millimeter wave, you know, you had a little bit of a discussion about that. Um, and I know millimeter wave had a lot of promise, a lot of uh, hype. Uh, and, and, you know, I think in the case of one carrier uh, is now backtracking on that. The, mm. the real future of it is kind of left to be desired. But what I'm hearing right now, it sounds like we're effectively punting on the usefulness of 5G and, and its application of millimeter wave. Is that right? Well, I, yeah, I guess um, I'm not privy to what all the operators, uh, you know, sort of product roadmaps are. Um, I mean, I do th you know, think that it is one where the hype maybe get out in front of what is really how it works in, in reality. Um, I think, as I mentioned, it's a little bit of a chicken the egg problem. So if, you know, the, the, uh, the handset manufacturers don't you know, invest in putting the technology in the iPhones and other smartphones, then it's, you know, why would AT&T and Verizon spend billions rolling out the infrastructure at the densities needed? So it, there's a little bit of chicken and egg problem. I, I, I don't think it's been punted on, but I do think um, they're in the rush to standardize uh, 5G, uh, you know, and as I mentioned, it carried over so many things from just LTE in order to get the standard out. Um, I think um, millimeter wave likely will see its, um, really bloom in the 6G era. I think there needs to be some uh, tweaks made to the standards, some fundamental tweaks. And I think, um, I think machine learning and some of these other new technologies will play a big role in enabling it. So I think, I mean, you know, we take for granted now that we have MIMO, right? And this is in every standard Wi-Fi from, to cellular, but it took like 10, 15 years to get, to get that technology really working in the field. And so millimeter wave, I mean, had never even really been prototyped in about 2014, 2015. 
So I think, uh, you know, we still, it's, it's, it's not, it's way too early to give up on it. I just think it needs a bit more time. Okay. Yeah, it, it, it just dawns on me. I don't know what that means for the future of the 5G equipment that's currently in place. I see. Um, like the, the millimeter wave supporting 5G. I mean, I think a lot of the 5G rollouts haven't even included millimeter wave. Like only in, I mean, you can, you can get a millimeter wave connection here in downtown Austin, for example. Mm -hmm. But I think, um, you know, I, I actually am embarrassed to say I don't have a millimeter wave compliant phone. I have an older, uh, so I, you know, I haven't gotten to play with uh, seeing when, you know, you get these uh, screaming data rates. But um, uh, yeah, so I don't know the, the full state of the deployments, but I know it's, it's, it's a very small percentage of 5G traffic is, is going over those links. Questions? Anyone? We've got Carl. Well, on the Starlink, you indicated that, uh, that you couldn't do a, zo a Zoom call over a low Earth orbit um, satellite connection. Is that, is that ever going to improve? Or? Oh, you can do one. It's just you can't do it straight from your iPhone. Okay. So you would need to go th the, 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 the receivers for these uh, Starlink systems, you know, they, they need to, I mean, you could maybe do it to a laptop if you built in the array to the laptop, but you need an antenna array that's directional and that points to the, towards a satellite with pretty high directionality, which... Um, so it's not really a mobile solution, it's more of a, f a fixed solution, right? Fixed or mobile to car or to, you know, a larger form factor. Is it the latency is, is the primary issue or? No, latency is not really the issue. It's just, it's just the uh, amount of, it's just the distance. Um, as far as like the, the losing the energy, yeah, the latency you can do you can do a two-way video call to over Starlink um, with uh, you know with the right modem, but the the, the modem is big. You gotcha. know, you, you, your phone connects or your laptop connects to that modem, and then that it goes up. So it's more like a fix to the home or to trucks, cars, that kind of thing for for now. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you were talking about the immersive experience going with 6G. Um, I don't know if you saw the interview a couple of days ago with Nick Clegg, um, President of Government Affairs for Meta. But he was kind of talking about that, and he, what he kind of described is that maybe coming out like with a little gla like a glass that would sit there, because he was talking about people walking around here, that you would actually have an eyepiece like in your car, and that's sort of the next step in terms of, of phones and, and it would just be kind of a live experience and, and things would pop up and, and that's how you would, you know, sort of interact with it. That Just curious as to your thoughts on it. Yeah, um, I did not see the interview, but I mean, I think that's consistent with what we're tracking. Um, I mean, I think, you know, in the short term, um, you know, we're doing a big project with Ericsson on this and, you know, they're working with Meta and, and Apple on the devices, but I think, you know, they definitely, having a see-through augmented reality device that, you know, sort of projects things on the real world is sort of the end game. But I think, but what we're actually engineering for the next five to 10 years is still more of a enclosed headset where there's, you know, complete control and then cameras on the outside bring in the, the real world. So I think it's, um, it's, it's, it's difficult to say what the first really breakthrough application will be, um, but I hope it's something that's where the human's not fully enclosed in a VR type headset and it's more of a, just an add on to the, uh, you know, that would be, you know, kind of, you know, not overwhelming, just like, you know, again, yeah, it projects somewhere so you kind of just see, oh, I have a text message coming in from my wife or, or you know, and, and, you know, using gesture recognition and other uh, ways of interacting with it, yeah. Any questions? Anything from the uh, home audience? I got one here. Uh, Jeff, Steve Gerdo from T-Mobile. I actually oh. know the answers to these questions, but I don't. But uh, maybe you can help me understand the spectrum and the layer case. That's okay. the thing that you were laying out okay, there. Okay, sure. And it was more on the Nokia side. You talked about that four, 500, really low band. Do we even have that availability in the US, or is that a long restacking process and maybe you can just talk about that. First. Yeah, yeah, I, I, you know, I, I have to concede, I'm not super knowledgeable on the lower band there. I mean, I know there's interest in trying to do it, but I, I agree that spectrum is pretty heavily uh, used. So I, I don't know what the, this, I think that it might be more aspirational at this point. I think the, the one I am very familiar with is that there's, you know, is active uh, work um, on getting, you know, 
seven bands at like seven gigahertz, 15 gigahertz release, the upper ones. But as far as the lower ones, yeah, I think they'll be, it'll, it'll, it'll be challenging to get global spectrum at those bands. Okay. Yeah, so I, I, I don't actually know the details. Understood. Yeah. And I guess the next question is, you talk about the 2.5, the 3.5, you know, where the carriers are situated at today. Maybe you could do some sort of comparison contrast on 2.5 versus 3.5. Um, and the propagation characteristics of each? Yeah, I mean, w what we've seen, we've actually done a, a big a pro recent project on using 700, 2.5, and 3.5 simultaneously and how you should allocate users as they move around. You know, big difference between 700 and 2.5, we haven't seen a really big difference, you know, to 3.5. Um, you know, you have a little bit more spectrum over there, up there. Obviously, it's a little more uh, scattering and uh, path loss at 3.5. But we haven't seen it, 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 we haven't seen dramatic differences personally, uh, you know, from our from our simulation work. Now I'm not in the field like T-Mobile actually seeing the live data, but the project we did, which I think was for well, it was with Facebook, but it was it was really intended for an AT&T's network actually. But um, we, we you know we didn't see that huge of a difference between 2.5 and 3.5. I don't know if that's what you're seeing also. Jeff, um, the. The idea of 6G also, based on what Nokia put up there, sounds like it's, there's a lot of innovation going on when it comes to the frequencies. Um, and I'm curious if you have a sense of where does Wi-Fi fit in on this picture when you're talking about 6G? Yeah, I, um, I mean, Wi-Fi carries it's really successful technology. You know, we, we, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's great at what it does. It's, uh, you know, they've obviously been given almost an entire one gigahertz band at, you know, and the six gigahertz band uh, has been opened up for unlicensed spectrum uh, use, mainly intended for Wi-Fi. So Wi-Fi has about two gigahertz of pretty decent spectrum um, to use. So I think it'll play a very big role. I, I don't see it playing a much different role in the 6G era than it does right now. I think it'll be, you know, our home networks are, you know, uh, you know, when, when you're indoors, like in a situation like this, you, you can use it. Um, but I mean, I think one interesting thing to, to watch is that in a way cellular has become a little bit more like Wi-Fi, you know, using um, higher frequency bands, larger bandwidths, um, denser deployments. And meanwhile, Wi-Fi has become a little bit more like cellular. They've you know, changed the standard to support slightly longer ranges. Um, the new version 802.11x AX uh, is an OFDMA system for the first time. So it's actually, you have can schedule different bands, which is just like a cellular system. So in a way, they've kind of gone from being very different to being much more similar. But you know, the main difference, of course, is that um, when you're using unlicensed spectrum and not supporting mobility, it just creates a much less expensive solution that you know, consumers can just buy and set up and it works. So I think that, yeah, it's hard to compete with free. And, um, but you know, it, it, but you also, as we know, Wi-Fi, you can't use it everywhere. And, it's, and having that always on connection is uh, indispensable. I think that question probably comes into play for the, uh, for the cable companies, uh, especially if they have a wireless product, which is a MVNO, but also relying on that cable Wi-Fi uh, mesh network uh, in the major cities. So OK, okay. good. Thank you. You've added more layers to the cake uh, in the in the right-hand side. So does that mean that there is going to be um, another multi-billion-dollar um, spectrum um, auctions to to crew all that? I would expect. I would expect so. Um, yeah, I, I so would think so. It's not simple. Uh, what I'm getting at is really not simple equipment change. In order, the, the barriers for entry is to um, purchase the spectrum equipment or spectrum ranges, right? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think as far as the upper spectrum, there may be different models other than an auction model at above 92 gigahertz because, you know, we, there's been studies that show, first of all, there's just a lot of spectrum up there, and there's studies that show that interference isn't such an issue if you're using a lot of directionality there because it, it just dies off so quickly. Um, but yeah, I think I would expect that, you know, there'll be, you know, auctions in that, in, that, in that sweet spot here in the seven gigahertz band, 15 gigahertz band, and I imagine it'll be, it'll be spendy. And those overlaps of frequencies that you see from the 5G to 6G, that's where you can have uh, equipment conversions. Um, Correct. Yeah, that's right. So this is, I guess that, that you would expect this spectrum to uh, carry over. And yeah, they might you know, continue to use 5G 
for quite some time in those in those bands. I mean, it's it's hard to say. I mean, one one interesting aspect um, of 5G is they designed it to be quote unquote future proof or forward compatible. And of course, this is kind of an impossible task, but they've put specific aspects in to make it so you could change, you know, add features to the standard without you know breaking backwards compatibility. So 5G, I wouldn't be surprised if 5G gear, which is still just rolling out now, you know, will still be you know, around well into the 12th, 23rd. I think it might have more longevity than some of the previous Gs. And, and one reason is that some of the use cases they're looking at, IoT use cases, cars, these have very long shelf life. I mean, they, they, these are long cycle times, so long replacement times. So the, the idea is you wanted something that would be deployable for two decades, you know. Is, is that just the standard that's deployable or would you have to change out the BBU and, and some of the technologies to continue that evolution? Well, to, I mean, to up, upgrade, um, you would, you know, have to change out the BBUs still. I mean, I think it's still not a, like a software-defined radio type situation. But, um, uh, you know, the idea being you might re farm some of the spectrum for 6G, but you might just leave some of it still just supporting 5G for quite some time. I mean, obviously, we still have lots of LTE uh, deployments. And so then those will live on for some time. And I think the legs on 5G, the tail on 5G might be even longer than LTE. That would be my guess. We talked about the, the average useful life for 5G equipment. I mean, based off of just release cycles, it looks like you're on a 10-year. Yeah, that's, the, that's the, been the cadence of these standards. And so, yeah, even if they aren't ready for a new standard, they'll just call it uh, <laughs> the next G <laughs> you know, for marketing reasons, right? But um, uh, yeah, that's it is about a 10-year cadence for uh, each that segment? Um, When you say, when, you, when we look at early on in the, the curves that Larry put together for us in terms of the, the uh, principle of the substitution of technology, right? So um, it, they tend to have about a 10-year total life, I'll call okay. it, right? And so when we think about 5G, yes, total life, but I wouldn't say average useful life is really when it penetrates the 50% mark. So is 5G really closer to um, historical averages of about seven to eight years of, of average remaining life, again, where it penetrates that 50% point? Yeah, I, you know, these, these, I'm not really an expert on these life cycle questions, to be honest, um, but uh, from a technology standpoint, um, like I said, I think 5G is designed in such a way that it it could. I wouldn't be surprised if it have a longer longer life longer lifetime. Okay, thanks. That's a good point of clarification, Carl. Um, yeah, the idea of the the 5G deployment. I mean, are we even at the 50 percent yet? Um, it's hard to. It's yeah, I guess you know, AT&T or, or T-Mobile friends probably have a better sense of like what uh, you know what the current network, uh, you know, how much of their spectrum has been moved over to 5G. Um, but yeah, I, I, I would think we're getting close to 50%, but I'm, I'm not actually sure. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, follow up question, Jeff. And, and I guess the question is, you're three blocks up the road, two to the right. I'm having a hard time seeing you because we're in the 6G world and I'm dealing with the chaos of the everyday life here. But uh, <laughs> I, I get the immersive technology, you know, where you're going, and you've been at this business for a long time. So if I can just pull you back a little bit on the 5G world, sure. and maybe you can chat, what do you see is the most promising use case or the best development in the next 12 to 36 months from the past research that you've did, if you can comment on any of that? On like sort of a technology network side or more on application side? Uh, on the application side and the, and the network technology, both of them would be great answers. Yeah, I mean, I think you know. Um, so you know, so, you know, as far as what standard is, the standards are doing. You know, one thing that they've there's a focus on is um, because this 5G waveform really was designed still for smartphones. There is an interest in you know uh, backing out smaller use cases to support IoT. So there is a, you know this this red cap I think was part of release 17. You're probably familiar with this reduced capability. So the idea is to actually intentionally design a version of the standard where you wouldn't have to support large bands, lar you know, all the bands. You can just support some of the bands, smaller bandwidths to, cr to really lower, lower cost and try to enable turbocharge some of these IoT um, applications. So um, I, 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 you know, I'd love to see an explosion of 
IoT applications in the next 12 or 36 months. I don't, I mean, I think that they've, they've tried to develop a standard to enable that. I don't know if that'll happen. Um, you know, also, even though I think of uh, these immersive experiences as, as a real 6G use case, there's a lot, been a lot of good work going on in the standards too. If, so if, if, if Apple does release, as expected, a, a, a XR headset in the next year, the network it has been uh, evolving to be able to support that, at least in principle, um, by tightening up some of the latency aspects, aligning, for example, the cadence of the frames. You know, you can do it so that the cadence comes at the XR frame rate, which is not aligned right now with the 5G cadence. Um, so these are just examples, but there's a, you know, a whole group in the standards trying to essentially retrofit uh, 5G to really work well for XR applications. So I think that's, that could be something that in two years uh, is, is something really new that we haven't seen before. Talk a little bit more about the low Earth orbit satellites. Do you potentially see, it sounds like you think of more as, um, as a collaboration with the existing wireless carriers as opposed to a full-fledged competitor? Yeah, I see it as, um, I don't think it'll replace you know, the terrestrial network by any means, um, but I think you know, it will allow a terrestrial network where there isn't one currently. So you know, as we discussed, it's a, it's a, it's a to the home or a, or a, a hotspot back, backhaul technology, so you could put you know, a little base station or Wi-Fi router up right now where you don't have broadband and it could connect to Starlink or Kuiper. Um, so yeah, they, I mean that's what I. I mean that, I, I, I don't. I, you know we have uh, Crown Castle is one of our affiliates, for example, and so I, I spend a lot of time talking with them. And they've, you know, so they're, you know, they have a huge investment, of course, in in towers, and you know they don't see it as a threat. They see it as like a way for them to actually put towers where they can't put towers now because they can connect now to a satellite rather than needing to lay fiber in those places. Um, going back to the IoT discussion, where do you see technologies like LoRa, uh, and do you see 6G or even 5G kind of taking taking over the role of providing low power connectivity to sensors and other devices? Yeah, so you know, um, yeah, there's all these different you know standards for providing wide area IoT, but I think. Um, I mean, certainly that's the goal of the standards bodies is to take over those applications because you know you just obviously can't. It's difficult to compete with the amount of infrastructure that's already out there for cellular. So you know if you can reuse that to support those applications, it seems to make a lot of sense to me. Versus you know some of these um, proprietary standards, uh, but um, yeah, I, I you know I I haven't worked that much on this on these use cases, so I don't know. I don't have a great sense for all the trade offs between these different. Uh, wide area IoT standards, unfortunately. Yeah. Do we have any questions from the uh, at home audience? Okay. Well, we may have covered all the questions that uh, I think we can think of. It's Larry's got one, though. I think we've touched on a little bit, but just. Uh, as an exercise, middle exercise, let's take away from the, the application area, the uh, immersive communications, you know, and stick to the other applications. Do we still have a viable uh, basis for doing 6G without, without that? Without immersive? Yes. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess the question then becomes, what will 6G need to do that 5G can't already do? Uh, exactly. Uh, so I think, um, yeah, so I mean, there, there is the view that 6G will be a incremental, uh, it could be incremental based on 5G. I think the non-incremental pieces are the ones I've highlighted, particularly the uh, uh, supporting this new spectrum. Um, I think you know, particularly this band, it's very interesting uh, from a technology standpoint, how you would do it. Um, and then, uh, you know, to really get good coverage and high capacity, I think the, um, uh, this, this, for a lot of these applications, though, even even beyond immersive, like the say the autonomous cars, which you know, six I don't know if you guys have covered the, the, these um, in your past conferences, but there, you know there was a very it was very bullish five years ago, right? I mean, um, uh, on having you know autonomous vehicles being on the road right now, you know, sure. like all over the place, and that's not really happened. I mean, it's been baby steps, which doesn't really surprise me. But I think um, you know one key thing is 
is, I think, the sensing piece to really enable that application. If that, it, it, I think the cellular connectivity really will make the difference between them being you know, kind of what Teslas can do now and then really having you know, vehicles really aware of what's happening around the corner and, and being able to really you know, have high safety while also um, you know, going pretty fast. Uh, I think you know, from, we have a lot of people working on that in our group, this specific application you know, with companies like Honda and Toyota and Stellantis. And they see that as a they're sort of key enabler to really making them both safe and be able to go the speeds that we're uh, used to in, in challenging yeah. environments. It'll be interesting to see whether the, the business model mentality of the current cellular providers can switch over to that very sort of safety related, high performance. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, it's, uh, uh, I mean, they're, they're, they, they definitely want to. I mean, they're, they're, they're very eager for new sources of revenue, um, is yeah. my, my sense. But, uh, but I think, yeah, it's, 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 it's challenging. Good. Good. Cases are fascinating. I remember, you know, 10 years ago at this conference being, um, you know, the discussion being what sort of use cases are there. And I think immersion, immersive experience is, is a better, more practical answer as opposed to something like remote surgery. You know, we were hearing that 10 years ago, and I think we're all kind of grateful that we're not, you know, on the other end of that. Just, you know, it, it sounds great, like a great idea, but I think, you know, the, the future of, of 6G and, and wireless um, you know, probably has a different uh, track to go. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of these applications, you really have to think, is this a cellular technology? Like, like remote surgery, I always scratch my head about that one too, because like presumably the patient and the doctor, one, you know, like, the patient's fixed and the doctor's fixed, no one's really moving. So, you know, you could do that with a high quality Wi-Fi and then over the wired backbone, right? So I think that's what's interesting about the immersive one is that it is outdoors, it is moving, it is in the, in the world. So that makes it a, makes it a, a cellular technology. I've got one more question for okay, you. Okay, great. <laughs> and, and since you're working on the technology front, I'm just curious, can you give your view of a closed versus an open network, like the Nokias and the Ericsons versus the others, and what you see in that field? Yeah, that's, that's actually a great question. That's one thing that I, was a, a mission from my um, talk. Um, you know, but yeah, like what, ran, what, 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 what role will, will ORAN play? And you know, will there be an opening up of interfaces like the ORAN Alliance envisions? I think um, this is a fascinating piece. It's actually one of our four pillars at 68 UT, um, but I didn't talk about it today. Um, I, I think um, two years ago, I would have said, yep, this is gonna happen because the operators want it to happen and you know, the Qualcomm's want it to happen because they think it'll speed up innovation and lower cost of the network, so thus create a more ubiquitous network. Um, so there's a lot of powerful forces that want to see this, these interfaces opened up. And so, you know, and no, it's, it's even to the point where Nokia and Ericsson, even though it's probably pretty clearly not in their interest to do that, um, are playing along because they just can't be viewed as obstacles. So we discussed this a lot in our meetings. I think is, uh, um, it, it, right now I, I know people who are very invested in ORAN it's, it's, it's harder than you think to like really open up these interfaces. I mean, it's, um, and have the system still work really well. So um, I think the view is that ORAN still has, uh, is, is taking, gonna take longer than originally forecast to reach this vision, um, where you, know, you could have you know, different vendors plug in different pieces. Um, but it seems to be definitely he heading that direction. Um, and I think you know, the, the cellular standards folks are trying to merge a bit with the ORAN folks. Um, and I think that merger might happen in 6G. Yeah, so I think it's a very, very, um, that's a, another big piece uh, of 6G. It's more on the core network side, but. Okay, well, uh, I think that covers all. No, Larry, you got another one? Yeah. Um, of your PhD students, you have 150. Yeah. Or 6G. And all of those are doing PhDs involving 6G related topics? Well, th th so there's th that number is a high number. And it's, um, uh, I would say, you know, it depends what you call 6G. So we have a lot of st students in the group working on like core machine learning mm -hmm. or on video processing. But, um, you know, things, things that we are important pieces of 6G. So they're, the definition of our PhD students are, is that they're PhD students advised by the faculty that are in 6G at UT. So I would say ones that you know are actively working on things like connected to 6G, where like you know 6G might be in their papers, is maybe 50, but it's still a very large number. 
And, and, and there's a lot of cross-pollination. So for example, my students are all working very heavily on 6G type projects, but we're using like you know, advanced new tools from uh, machine learning. And so our machine learning faculty and us have joint proposals and the students talk. And so there's like this cross-pollination. True. Yeah, so but, but yeah, but I'd say uh, people actually actively working on wireless, maybe 50. But it's a lot. It's, a, it's probably more than any other school in the US. Good. Yeah, thanks.